from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Thelma Ritter, Terry Moore, and Stephen McNally in Pickup on South Street. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's story has a most unusual cast of characters. A pickpocket who discovers he has stolen an important piece of microfilm from a sultry messenger for the communists. And an unforgettable creature known as Mo. We bring these fascinating characters together in a hard-hitting drama from 20th Century Fox. Pick up on South Street. And as our stars, we have glamorous Terry Moore, talented Stephen McNally, and Thelma Ritter to recreate... A great portrayal of Moe. Now, Act One of Pick Up on South Street, starring Stephen McNally as Skip McCoy, Elma Ritter as Moe, and Terry Moore as Candy. <laughs> I had come to New York from Washington. We had one good suspect, a girl. Our only hope was that she'd lead us to the other. It was a Tuesday morning, shortly before 9 o'clock. Enyart, my assistant, was with me. We followed the girl into a crowded subway train. It was jammed with office workers, early morning shoppers, all of us standing in this human lurching car hanging onto the strap. I never would have noticed the young man if I hadn't been watching her. Then his right hand started to move. I watched him fascinated. He was an expert, all right. I saw him open her purse and remove a lock. And then suddenly we'd stopped at a station. People were shoving their way in and out. The young man disappeared among them. Then the girl walked out. Enyart and I were behind her. Look, why don't I follow the girl and you try to pick him up? You got a good look at him, didn't you? Try and find him. Downtown New York in the morning rush hour? You sure he was a thief? You sure she didn't know he was taking that woman? I'm not sure of anything. Hold it, hold it. The girl had stopped walking. She was looking in her handbag frantically. Then she hurried into a drugstore and went into a phone booth. But I know I had it with me when I left. I know I had it. Somebody must have picked my purse. I'm sure of it. Joy, what'll I do? You better come back here. Maybe I should go up and see him anyway. I said to come back. Come back right away. He's scared. She should be. Don't lose her, Henry. Where are you going? Police headquarters. <laughs> Seat, Mr. Zara. We don't often get a chance to cooperate with you people from Washington. You're in charge of the pickpocket squad? Right. Well, Captain, I'm looking for a man, but I don't know his name. Then we're in trouble. He stole a wallet out of a woman's purse on the subway. You know what he looks like? Yes. Then we're in business. Let's look at the files, Mr. Zara. They uh, kind of hinted upstairs the communists are mixed up in this. The girl he stole the purse from has been passing military information to commie agents. You know the man she was uh, passed the stuff to? No, we got a line on everyone else except him. He's Mr. Big. All we know is as soon as he gets his hands on that film, he'll cross the ocean with it. Film? This film was in our wallet? Yes. Say, how many photographs have you got here? Known pickpockets? Soon about a thousand. Uh, how long will it take to go through them? All day, maybe longer. Then I'd better start, hadn't I? <laughs> more I can tell you, Joy. It's just one of those tough breaks. The guy who picked your purse, we've got to find him. In New York? How? You're crazy. We've got to find that film. Film? That's right, a piece of film. Microfilm, maybe three inches long, was in your wallet. What's so valuable about a piece of film? It's a new patent for a chemical formula. You're talking like... like it was hot. Look, how many times do I have to tell you we're not criminals? But this is big business, cutthroat business. I'm in a spot. Joy, look, I'm sorry it happened, but there's nothing I can do about it. All you can do is tell your boss I had my bag picked. You'd walk out on me now? Look, we made a deal. You promised me no more deliveries after we broke up. And you promised me that you'd make this last one for me. Well, sure I did, but I can't help it Candy, somebody... look. Andy, you're a smart girl. You, you can figure out a way to find him. But I don't know anything about pickpockets. Well, you know people who know people. You're going to throw that in my face again? You've got to help me, Candy. You know what he looks like. If I had your contacts, I, I wouldn't be begging like this. Well, maybe... Maybe I can get you a lead. Look, Candy, you find that pickpocket for me and I'll never bother you again. Never. All right, Joy. All right, I'll try. 
An hour went by. I was getting nowhere with that mountain of photographs in Captain Tiger's office. I asked if there wasn't some faster method of running down that pickpocket. Well, there's one character who can help us out, maybe. It's not exactly easy, Mr. Zarin. Well, we're fighting time. Yeah, I know. Well, maybe Mo can speed it up a little. Who's Mo? With any luck, you'll find that out in about 20 minutes. Let me see what I can do. Mo was a little old woman. She wandered into the office carrying a battered little case. She put it on the captain's desk and opened it up. It was filled with ties, neckties. I got a polka dot job that was just made for your personality, Tiger. It's a good thing you buzzed me, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's a beaut. Only I'm not buying ties. Oh, no ties, huh? Who's that creep? <laughs> What's he in for? He looks like a second-story cat burglar. He's a friend of mine. We've got to get quick action. Yeah, everything around here is always an emergency. Hey, this got anything to do with homicide? No. I got no killers on my table. I want to stay in business long enough to feed this kitty. How's it doing, Mo? It's getting fat. I got almost enough to buy the stone and the plot. You lose that dough, it's Potter's Field, eh? This, I do not think, is a very funny joke, Captain Tiger. Well, I just meant you ought to be more careful how you carry a background. Look, Tiger, if I was to be buried in Potter's Field, it'd just about kill me. (laughs) I I got a place picked out on Long Island. It's, It's private. You got to be screened before they'll let them put you in there. That's how exclusive it is. No ties, huh? Uh Uh-uh. So what's the score? We're looking for a cannon who binged a girl in the subway for a wallet. Well, ain't he pigeonholed with the mall buzzers? We haven't got time to go through all those files. I thought maybe you knew some first-class grifter who'd been working the subways. Who's he, the victim's old man? No. He's the big thumb. That tie you're wearing, mister. Stripe job would give you more personality. I'll remember that, thanks. You get a good look at this grifter? Yes, about six feet, dark hair. Ah, medium, short, tall, dark, light, fat, skinny. Thousands of cannons look like that. It's the technique. Every one of them's got his own trademark. Now, um, how about this tie here? Stripes, see? Look what it does for him, Tiger. It's yours for a buck. Okay, here. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, tell me, mister, when this happened? A couple of hours ago. Mm, Rush hour, crowded subway. Was he standing to the left of her or to the right of her or behind her? Behind her, then he moved around and faced her. Carrying a newspaper? Yes. Rolled or folded? Folded, I think. What do you mean you think? What kind of a big summer we got here? Listen, mister, you gotta be sure. Tell you all these cannons got their own way of doing things. All right, it was folded. The top side, was it the front page or the classified ad? Classified. <laughs> Southpaw? No, he used his right hand. He held the paper in his left. Kind of at an angle? Kind of like this? Yes. Yeah. Did you see him close the purse after he lifted the wallet? Yes. He put the paper over it like this when he closed it? Yes. And violins were soft and sweet and, um... Maybe I know your boy. You better wait out now, Mr. Zahn. I'm not so sure I like this. It's the way she works, just for a minute. Thanks. Mo, we gotta work fast. Look, let's not go into that again. What do you want from me, Tiger? Do I personally raise the price on hamburgers and pork and beans and frankfurters? Is it my fault that the cost of living is going up? Now, this here is my account book. See, my price list. One I should tell you? Go ahead, tell me. Here in my little book are my prices as of this morning. When the cost of living goes up, my prices go up. When the cost of living goes down, my prices go down. In my book, the price on the board for a cannon is 50 bucks. Fifty dollars. I told you before we got. You'll no make such a millionaire's salary you can afford to pay me for all my tips. Thirty-five dollars. I'll tell you what I'll do, Tiger. I'll give you the name of eight cannons that fit the job. See, free for nothing. But I'll bet you thirty-eight dollars and fifty cents that one of them buzzed that mall's wallet. I'll bet you thirty-eight fifty. You're wrong. You got a piece of paper? I'll write down the name. There on the desk. And hey, come in, Mister Zarr. She wrote down eight names. The captain got their photographs out of the files. Yes, it was that simple. This one, eh? You sure, Mr. Zara? I'm sure. He skipped McCoy. He got out of prison a week ago. Looks like he's begging for another conviction. Well, he's got to live, too, don't he? Where can I find him? Haven't even got a lead on him. (laughs) You don't know. (laughs) Thought you knew everything about everybody. He hasn't been out long enough to settle. But I know how he operates. He's holed up somewhere. If you don't mind, uh, Tiger, you and me, we got a little wager. Okay, okay. 
Here. Uh, you never was a good loser, Tiger. That's 40 bucks. Give me the chance. Keep your shirt on. About McCoy. Yeah, it's uh, going to be pretty hard to run him down, huh, Tiger? Might take you almost a week. What are you angling for, a side bet? Well, every extra buck has the meaning all its own. It just so happens I haven't got any left. And it just so happens that I know where he's shacked up. That's part of the bet. Listen, Tiger, do you realize that the cost of living has gone up 50%? No, I got no more time. Then what are you stalling for? Why don't you name me a pitch? Okay, okay. Next time I'll give you odds. Two to one. How's that? The promise? Yeah. All this gibbling and gabbling. Give me that pencil and another piece of paper. <laughs> Well, I learned a lot that morning. I learned about Mo, who sold neckties. And information, in the hope that someday she'd have money enough for a respectable funeral. But more important, I learned where we could find Skip McCoy. His residence was on the waterfront, a battered, weather-beaten shack built on pilings over the dirty water. McCoy was home. He watched us with amusement while we turned the shack upside down. We found nothing. All that looking around, you must be worn out. Want a beer? Yeah, maybe I will, McCoy. How about you? No. There's no electricity here, but the beer's always cold. Keep away from that window. And I'm just getting a beer. You see this rope? It's tied to a wooden box. The box is down there in the water, and the beer's in the box. <laughs> Smart, eh? Once upon a time, they sold bait here. Live bait and fishing tackle. That's how they kept the bait alive in a box like this. Is, uh... Is this a pickup? You've been out only a week, and right away those fingers got to play the subway circuit. What did you do with the wallet you lifted from the girl this morning? Me? Grifting a dame in a subway? Okay. Arrest me. You were spotted lifting that wallet. The girl was carrying TNT, and it's going to blow up right in your face. What girl? I'll jam that grin right down your cheek. Go ahead, slug me. I'll see you hit the backyard without pay for a year. What's the matter, Captain Tiger? Are you nervous? McCoy, all we want is the wallet. If you got rid of it, tell us. If you threw the film away, tell us where. Uh, who's your friend? Answer him. I'll tell you again, I've been clean ever since I got out. Why don't you haul that girl down here to identify me? We don't have to. I saw you in the subway. But you've got to nail the goods on me, mister. And I'm clean. That film you stole had classified government information on it. We've been following that girl for weeks. Just as we were about to grab a top red agent receiving that film from her, you broke up the ball game. Now, can't you see how important it is? You cooperate and I'll drop the charges. You know how I'd like to make this rap stick, but what he's got to do is more important. Oh, you boys are talking in the wrong corner. I'm just a guy keeping my hands in my pockets. If you refuse to cooperate, you'll be as guilty as the traitors that gave them the A-bomb. You waving a flag at me? I'm warning you, McCoy. And I'm warning you. I didn't grip that film and you can't prove that I did. And if I said I did, you'd slap a rap across my teeth no matter what promises you made. McCoy, do you know what treason means? Who cares? Make your pinch or get out! McCoy wouldn't budge. He stood there grinning at us when we left. It wasn't until days later that we learned how McCoy had fooled us. After we left, he hauled up that case of beer again, hauled it up out of the water. But this time, McCoy wasn't thirsty, just curious. The wooden beer case had a false bottom, a compartment sort of a shallow drawer held in place by a couple of metal pins. He made it completely watertight. Inside, carefully wrapped in oilskin, was a collection of jewelry, some cash, and a tiny metal tube. In the tube was the microfilm. But what was on it that was so important? There was one way for McCoy to find out. He went to the public library, to a room marked periodical department, microfilm library. May I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I, uh... I'd like to see a copy of the New York Times, huh? Uh, January 5th, 1947. Mm. Fill out this card, please. You, um, you got it on microfilm? Yes, I think so. Well, I, I just wanted to see the front page. Uh, how do I look at it? Oh, it's quite simple, sir. We put the film in one of the viewers over there. It's magnified through the glass. Oh. You'll have no trouble finding what you want, I'm sure. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll, uh, I'll fill out the card. McCoy hadn't the slightest interest in the front page of that newspaper. When he was certain no one was looking, he removed the film of the newspaper and inserted the strip of stolen film. But what he saw told him very little, just a series of numbers and letters. The film was in code. While all this was going on, the girl from the subway was trying to find him. Her search took her down to the Bowery to a cheap rooming house. She found Mo on the second floor. So, are you Mo? 
You want to buy some neckties for your boyfriend? You've been recommended as the best pickpocket stoolie in the business. What kind of talk is that, calling me a stoolie? I was brought up to report any injustice to the police authorities. I call that being a good citizen. But you get paid for it. You're going to knock it? I'm looking for the pickpocket who lifted my wallet this morning in the subway. Oh, so you're the muffin. What do you mean? Oh, one cannon talks to another when word gets around. What was in the wallet? What was in it is personal. How personal? What difference does it make? He didn't know what was in it when he took it. How do you know? You got a boyfriend, ain't you? Look at these beautiful ties. I uh, happen to carry a complete line of uh, personality neckwear uh, bargain prices. Look, I'll tell you just what happened, nothing else. You want to do business or not? You got any happy money on you? Happy money? Yeah, money that's going to make me feel happy. What else? <laughs> How happy? Fifty dollars? I'm not sure. Maybe I have. Sit down, honey. Like you said, you just tell me what happened. It was dark when Skip McCoy returned to his shack. Waterfront was deserted. He started up the catwalk. But suddenly he saw something. The gleam of a flashlight through the broken boards of the shack. He waited at the door. When it opened, he swung hard. It was some moments before the prowler recovered. You... You play for keeps, don't you? Well, how did I know it was a dame? Now, what were you looking for? I want my wallet. What wallet? The one you lifted from my bag this morning. <laughs> now, do I look like a pickpocket? You sure do. Okay, what about my purse this time? Is there anything left? It's all there, including those crummy neckties. How much did Mo get out of you? I figure it cost you about 50 bucks to find me if I know Mo. Well, don't look so scared. Mo's all right. She's got to eat. Look, did you throw it away? Huh? Mr. McCoy, I've got to find that wallet. Why? It's no good to you or anyone else. No. There was a piece of film in it. Oh. <laughs> you mean you came all the way over here just to find a piece of film? Well, you got me in an awful mess when you took it. What kind of a mess? You working for some uh, blackmailer? Oh, no, nothing like... Of course not. Look, there are pictures of my brother, Mickey. He was killed in Korea. My mother was waiting to see those pictures. Oh, oh. Huh. Well, why didn't you go to the cops, honey? Well, I... I got in a little trouble with them, and my mother just died. Well, you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. You, you feeling better now? I mean, where I clipped you. I guess I'm all right. Uh, you and the, uh, the cops. What kind of trouble, honey? Oh, a girl makes mistakes. Oh, sure. I was only asking because I... Uh... Because what? Oh, I don't know. Uh, you're a very pretty girl. You look for oil, sometimes you hit a gusher. Am I talking too much? No, you're nice. I like to hear you talk. I like to hear you talk, too. So you told me how much your brother's worth, huh? What do you want? Blood? I just want to make your mother happy, that's all. Then you do have the film. But you see, Muffin, there might be another little old lady looking for pictures of her boy. I gotta make sure it's your brother, Mickey. Okay. I'll tell my mother. Yeah. Yeah, you do that. Good night, Mr. McCoy. Good night. And uh, come back again, honey, huh? Real soon. I'll pick up on South Street in a moment. Our servicemen around the world have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. And they're finding out that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. For instance, in many areas, there's a belief that trees and their products bring good luck. Now, this undoubtedly dates back to the earliest existence of man, but continues to the culture of other people. On many Pacific islands, branches are used to ward off evil spirits or to cure diseases. In some of the western countries, certain trees are thought to be lucky for the person who touches them. Well, this might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, it's reflected in our own culture, too. We say that when we want good luck for the future, we knock on wood. How oh, that doesn't make us superstitious or primitive, we may not even believe in it. We, well, we just do it from habit. We also put a lot of stock in the Christmas tree. And the people of some other countries, this business of bringing trees into the house may look pretty strange. We have another very delightful belief in the effectiveness of a sprig of mistletoe, particularly if a pretty girl standing underneath it. 
So you see, we share in our own way this age-old belief of other people. True enough, the customs and traditions of people vary around the world. But while a way of doing things may be different, the ideals remain the same. These customs and traditions are important to the people who follow them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Pick Up on South Street. Starring Thelma Ritter as Moe, Terry Moore as Candy, and Stephen McNally as Skip. With Dan Riss as Mr. Zara. <laughs> We were waiting on South Street, Captain Tiger and I. We trailed the girl. She went back to the apartment in Midtown, to Joey's place. Did you find him? Has he got it? Yes, but he knows, Joey. He knows what's on the film. Oh, what I had to go through to run that guy down. A professional stool pigeon took me for $50. Oh. She calls herself Mo. She lives at 134 Bowery, up over a tattoo parlor. Sells neckties as a front. What did you mean, he knows what's on it? He's been around, Joey. He's shaking you down. You mentioned my name. No, no. Does he know where I live? What are you getting so excited about? You should be celebrating. I found him for you, didn't I? So I'll give you his address and you can go over and make a deal. No. No, I, I can't take a chance. Well, I like that. You can't take a chance, but you sent me over there. Look, it's, it's different with you, Candy. In what way? Well, he, he might have been hired for the job. You think he knew what he was stealing? It could be. Well, then why didn't he contact you? It doesn't make sense. Look, he might be playing both hands against the middle, don't you see? No, I don't see, but maybe there's something about that film that you haven't told me, Joy. No, look, Kenny, there's nothing complicated about it. It's just that, well, if he knew what I was after, he jumped the price, that's all. I told you I was in a cutthroat business. These manufacturers do anything to eliminate each other. That's the reason that I've got to keep out of it. And that's the reason that you've got to go back to him. Well, I'm not going to. Look at my face. He hit me. Oh, come on now, Kenny, listen to me. This is all part of your last delivery. You started the job, finish it. Here, look. Here's $500. Offer him 50 If he holds out for more, give him another 50 Whatever's left is yours, honey. You can buy a lot of nice clothes for 400 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Good. You come back with a film. I'll wait for the office. Why the office? Because Fenton's waiting for it. Fenton's waiting at the office. Come on in, honey. Come in and sit down. All alone, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Uh, where's your mother? She couldn't come. Oh, that's too bad. You bring some money? How come a nice fella like you goes around picking handbags in the subway? (laughs) Honey, the last time I worked the subway, I was in short pants. The last time was this morning. How many times have you been caught at it? Well, uh, I'll tell you, baby. Whenever I'm caught, it's always an accident. Like, uh, oh, maybe I just don't feel so good, you know. Or maybe I'm just not concentrating. I've been tapped once or twice. That's part of the business. Red side of the ledger. You mean if they caught up with you this morning, you'd be sent to prison? Nothing happens when I'm concentrating. You're a dope to take chances like that. How much money do you think people carry around? How much would you be carrying around right now? Come on, give. Your hand, you've got fingers like an artist. Yeah, yeah, but when they stay empty, they get nervous. Come on. How'd you get to be a pickpocket? How does anybody get to be what they are? Things happen, that's how. Look, don't get sore. Then don't ask stupid questions. I only ask because I'm interested. Interested? How much is it worth to you? How much is what worth it to me? Well, you're here to buy, aren't you? Look, you're not going to raise the ante by smearing my lipstick. Then why the pitch? You want to hear something funny? Because I like you. Everybody likes everybody when they're kissing. And everybody's always different. And tomorrow you'll like somebody else, huh? Look, I've kissed a lot of guys, Skip. But honest, I never felt like this. Oh, now you're talking like you got a fever. How much did you bring, baby? I don't want to talk about it. How much? Five hundred dollars. I was going to offer you fifty. Five bills. Keep it. Keep it and go back. You tell that commie I want a big score for that hunk of film and I want it in cash. Tonight. Are you crazy? You tell me. You people are supposed to have all the answers. Tell you what, I don't oh, even know... Oh, come on. Drop the act. So you're a red. Your money's as good as anybody else's. I'm a red. Me. I know what you're after, and I know what it's worth. So help me, I don't know what you're talking you about. You know, all right. But what you don't know is that after I grifted your wallet, the cops came down and paid me a little visit. 
You know how hard it is to spot my fingers in action? It can't be done. But a guy did it. You know how he did it? He was watching you. And that guy you were supposed to pass the film to. You don't know anything about him either, huh? He's still waiting, Muffin. He's itching for it. Look, Skip, the way I feel about you, I wouldn't lie to you. You've, you've got to believe me. i got to believe nobody. I'll do business with a red, but I don't have to believe one. <laughs> oh, that's quite a wallop you pack, honey. But don't make me mad. You just tell your old lady I'm shaking you reds down for 25 grand. And I want it tonight. <laughs> Come in, Candy. I've been waiting for you. Hello, Mr. Fenton. Where's Joey? He's here. Joey told me you'd have something for us. Well, I don't. I don't. Oh, what a line he gave me. And me falling for it. You know what's crazy about the whole thing? You know what he wants? $25,000. $25,000 for that film. Did you ever hear of such a crazy thing? You know why? You know what he said? Well... He's crazy. He said I was a commie. Did you ever hear of such a thing? Oh, what makes people like that? Where do they get such ideas? All right. He wants to shake you down. But to start calling us commies... Joey! And you know what else he told sit me? Sit down. Joey! You don't have to say it all over again, I heard. You should have taken care of him yourself. You know, I couldn't take a chance. I know you're getting paid to take him. Joey, that man in there, the other room, who is he? It doesn't matter, miss, who I am. Mr. Fenton? Yes, sir? I'll tell you for the last time. Security is not interested in all this confusion. That film must be delivered to me by tomorrow night. That's all I have to say. I'm leaving too, Joey. Like the man said, get that film. You can't do it, Joey. No, Where Joey. Where you live? Where? If you kill him, you'll get the chair. Joey, look, I, I know we're all washed up, but I still owe you something for the break you gave me. I, I don't want to see you end up on a slab. All right. I'll find him myself. I'll find him the same way you... Do. No. No, I, I, I'll tell you. He, he lives at 704 West 47th Street. Near 10th Avenue. In the basement. We knew the three men Candy had seen, Joey Fenton and the stranger, but there was still someone bigger. All three were trailed when they left. So was Candy. She took a cab to the rooming house over the tattoo parlor. I, I didn't know who else to go to. What can I do? Please tell me what can I do. Why don't you go to the cop? Who'd believe that I didn't know what was in my purse? Would you believe me? You know what they do to people who hand out government secrets? Times like this, my necktie business don't seem so important. Oh, Mo, you've got to promise me. When Joy asks you, you don't know. You don't know where Skip lives. Joey won't find me. He knows where you live. Then why ain't he here? I gave him a phony address for Skip McCoy. He's looking for him now. Why don't you tell Skip? Oh, he won't believe me either. Uh-uh. <laughs> so he crawled under your skin, too. He's as shifty as a snake, but I love him. You sold him out for $50. Oh, look, some people settle apples, lamb chops, headache pills. Me, I peddle information. Skip ain't sorry, he understands me. Live in a different kind of a world. Oh, once in a while he gets hot under the collar if I sell him short. But you but wouldn't he... sell him to a commie. What do you think I am, an informer? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this muffin's a real softy. Okay, kid, hand me my box of ties. Maybe I'll go out and do a little peddling. Give me a cup of coffee, Oscar. How are you, Skip? Hi, Ma. How's business? Okay. You're eating late, huh? Uh, I've been busy. I've been looking all over for you. Stay away from your shack, Skip. There's, there's a guy gunning for you. Well, he won't have any trouble finding me. Everybody in town knows where I live. I didn't pinpoint you honest. I gave Tiger the name of eight cannons, but that creep that was with him, he fingered your picture like a shot. Oh. Confidentially, it sounded like your kind of an act. How much did you raise on me for your stone and plot? Oh, now, don't get sore. Skip, they'd have caught up with you in a few hours anyway. I, I just, you know, chopped down the time a little. Yeah, that's mighty nice of you. Who's gunning for me? What's the matter with you? Playing footsies with the commies. Are you waving the flag, too? Listen, I knew you since you was a little kid. You was always an honest yeah, crook. Yeah, well, uh, I need money. Who don't? I just never figured you for a loan. Oh, 
Drink your coffee, Ma. Stop breaking my heart. Even in our crummy business, you gotta draw the line somewhere. And that muffin you grifted, she's okay. She stuck her chin way out for you. Oh, you look tired, Ma. You better go home. Yeah. Only stop using your hands, Skip, and start using your head. Also, that kid's falling for you. Bye, Skip. See you, Ma. Hi, mister. You want to buy a tie? Latest Fifth Avenue sensation. Hi, hi. Mo went home. She started her tinny phonograph with her favorite number. She lay down on her bed, put on her glasses, and took out her little account book. With a little luck, she'd have that headstone and cemetery plot all paid for in maybe one more year. Yeah, with any kind of a break, she'd make it. And then the door opened, and a man walked in. What are you buying, mister? The name and address of the pickpocket you sold to a girl tonight. Oh. Well, maybe I forgot. Come on, here's a hundred dollars to help you remember. You pant like a dog. Two hundred. What's this guy made out of, Diamond? Just the name and address. I ain't as young as I used to be, mister. Things kind of go and come in my mind. Maybe I'll remember it in a couple of days. Maybe you won't be around in a couple of days. You threatening to blow my head off? Well, you ask a silly question, you get a dopey look. Well, look, what are you holding back under? You'd sell anybody for buttons. Yeah, but not to you, mister. Look, I haven't got a lot of time. You haven't got a lot of time. Listen, mister, when you come in here tonight, you've seen an old clock running down. I'm tired. I'm through. Happens to everybody sometimes. It'll happen to you someday, too. With me, it's, it's a lot of things. My head aches and my back aches. And I can't sleep nights. And it's so hard to get up in the morning and walk the streets and climb the stairs. I go right on doing it. What do you want me to do, knock it? I, I go on making a living so I can die. But even a fancy funeral ain't worth waiting for if I got to do business with crumbs like you. And I know what you're after. What? What do you know? What? I know you commies are looking for some film that don't belong to you. You just talked yourself into an early grave. What else do you know? What? What do I know about commies? Nothing. All I know is I just don't like them. So I don't get to have the fancy funeral. Well, anyway, I tried. Look, mister, I'm so tired that you'd be doing me a big favor if you'd blow my head off. And you might as well, because if you don't, I'm going to the cops. And I'll tell them about you. For free. This one is on me, I'll tell them. And then I... Two hours later, Skip Malone was in police headquarters. Not in Captain Tiger's office, but upstairs in homicide. Looks like we've been wasting time, McCoy. That phone call just now. They say you're clean. Who says? Captain Tiger. Yeah, I'll tell him. Tiger? Surprising, isn't it? He loved an alien, McCoy. But he says to turn you loose. About Mo. Where did it happen? She was lying on her bed with the phonograph going. Shot and killed. She got no folks. Nobody at all. Maybe somebody will claim her. Yeah. And what if they don't? You know the answer. Potter's Field. More than anything, she wanted a swell funeral. Somewhere's out in Long Island. I know. It's all written down in her book. Only Mo was a little short of cash, as far as we know. Yeah. I, uh... I got a couple of hundred dollars. Make it Long Island. That's something for you and the morgue to talk about. Use the other phone if you want to. I got to call the captain. Skip McCoy stayed clear of the shack that night. And the next morning, he went out to Long Island. He returned to his shack early that afternoon. Candy was waiting for him. Mo's dead, Skip. Last night, she was killed. Yeah, I know. You bring the money? No. Then what are you doing here? I'm not sure I know myself. Skip, I... I went to Mo last night. I begged her not to tell Joey where you live. She wouldn't tell you, Skip. Who is Joey? 
Your old lady? You're not listening. Is Joey your old lady? Yes, I... I told Mo all about him. I knew he'd find her. You think he did it? He was ordered to find you. I saw him take a gun, but... Honest, Skip, I didn't think he'd kill Shut me. Up. It's my fault, but I didn't uh, know. I got no right to yell at you. She just didn't figure to go in that way. I've been up all night, just walking the street. Yeah, it's all right. I didn't know where to go. When I read about it in the papers, but... Oh, I just had to see you, Skip. I had to tell you how it happened. Yeah, yeah, I know. You've been so wrong about Take me. Take it easy. I had nothing to do with it. I any... told you, it's all right. I, I see the whole picture now. This Joey, where does he live? He's got a gun. Don't worry, I'll let the cops handle him. Where does he live? 340 West 96th Street. You're not going there. Why not? I've got a piece of film that he wants. He better have that 25 grand ready. The girl watched him as he hauled the wooden beer case out of the water, as he opened the hidden compartment and took out the tube containing the film. Skip couldn't see her. He couldn't see her take one of the empty bottles from the shelf and bring it crashing down on his head. She left the shack a moment later. I was waiting across the street. She led me straight to police headquarters to Captain Tiger's office. Here's the film you've been looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's the film the commies want. Skip told me to bring it to you right away. Skip told you? Yeah. Somebody followed me here. I took a cab. He was in another car. I followed you. Just take a chair, please. This film, can you tell? Well, let me see it against the light. Now, just relax, miss, and answer a few questions. Well? How did you contact Skip McCoy? A lady called Mo. Your friends have anything to do with the murder? Yes. You'll say that under oath? I'll tell you everything I know under oath. Do you know it was on this film when Skip lifted it from your purse in the subway? Look, mister, I didn't say anything about anybody lifting anything from my purse. I came here to help you out. That's the way Skip wanted it. <laughs> All right, so he's changed. It's possible, isn't it? Let him be decent if he wants to. And what's the difference why he sent me? I'm here with the film. That's enough. How long have you known Joey was a communist agent? I didn't know until Skip told me honest. You want to help us fight commies, don't you? That's why Skip sent me, to help you. What I'm going to ask you to do might be dangerous. I'm here. Go back to Joey with this film. Carry through with the original plan. Now, whether you make delivery or Joey does, it won't matter. We'll jump when the film passes to the man we want. Will you do it? Yeah, sure. Here's the phone. Call him up. Tell him you've got the film. Now? Yes. Okay. But I told you, Captain Tiger, there's a big difference between a traitor and a pickpocket. Maybe so. Joy, this is candy. I've got it. I've got the film. The final act of Pick Up on Self Speed in a moment. When the 84th Engineering Corps was stationed south of Seoul in Korea, a young North Korean was employed in the kitchen. He was most appreciative of the work, cleaning vegetables, washing dishes, scrubbing the floor, for which he was paid about $15 a month. One morning, when he reported for work, he brought the news that a new baby had arrived during the night. Happy and proud as he was over the event, he confided in embarrassment that he and his wife had not been able to provide clothing for the child because there was nothing to buy in the stricken city. The young mess sergeant under whom he served wrote to his wife about all this, and she promptly bought an entire layette and sent it to her husband to give to the Korean parents. The Korean father, when handed the package, couldn't control his emotion and wept tears of joy that, from so far away, such wonderful gifts should come to his small son. Such acts as these by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of Pick Up on South Street, starring Terry Moore as Candy, Stephen McNally as Skip, and Thelma Ritter as Mole, with Dan Riss as Mr. Zara. Yes, Candy was doing exactly what we wanted her to do. She told Joey on the phone that she'd have the film in half an hour to pick it up at her apartment. We took our positions on the street and waited for Joey to leave. But Joey had more on his mind than just that piece of film. Well, I got it, Joey. Here, 
Here in this envelope. Real anxious to give it to me, huh? Real anxious to get me out of here. You've been screaming for it ever since McCoy, we... McCoy, I went where you told me. Why did you give me a phony address? I, I had to. Why? Because I knew what you'd do to him. I didn't want you to kill him. I didn't want you to go to the chair. Where have you been since last night? With him, p- a part of the time. You're going to tell me the truth. The truth? What are you up to? What are you trying to pull on me? Go ahead. Rough me up if you don't believe me, but I got the film. How did you get it? He wanted $25,000. How did you do it? How? Does it matter? Look, I wasn't lying to you, Joy. I... I just didn't want to see you get in trouble. Oh, you know how I feel about you. I'd do anything for you, Joy. I- I'd give you anything. You'd I- do anything for me, huh? This film, part of it's missing. He cut off one of the frames. Now, where does he live, McCoy? Where'll I find him? He's gone. I, I-, I don't know where he is. Joy! Where does he live? I don't know. I don't know. Get away from I that gave door. I you what you wanted, Joy. Now, let me alone. Let me... We heard the shot from the street. We left a man at the front and rear entrances and rushed into the apartment house. Joey was gone. The girl was pretty bad off, but still alive. I was phoning for the ambulance when we heard two more shots from the street. Detective Gibbs, Mr. Zara. Joey got out by way of the dumb waiter. He saw Gibbs and he killed him. Gibbs didn't even have a chance to pull his gun. What about the girl? Still unconscious. The film? Gone. I better call the commissioner. You got the file on Joey? Yeah, sure. We've got to find him. We'll find him in less than an hour. Every cop in the force will know what he looks like. If he's recognized, I want him followed, Captain. No matter what happens, I don't want an arrest until he passes the film. Yes, sir. First Mo, then the girl here, then Gibbs. Who's next, Mr. Zara? <laughs> I got the answer to Captain Tiger's question late that night in the hospital. The girl was able to talk now. But all she'd talk about was Skip McCoy and how we had to protect him. Joey was going to kill him. McCoy was still very much alive when we picked him up the following morning. We told him about Candy. He said he wasn't interested. But when he left us, he went straight to the hospital. Skip. Yes. You all right? I guess so. The nurse was just popping off about you. How come? I don't know. I... I suppose I've been giving them a bad time. I was afraid they wouldn't find you in time. They found me. That piece of film, you cut part of it off. How would you know? Joy. Hey, sure I knew. I had to tell you before I got to you. I play everything smart with you. I'm breaking a beer bottle over my head, taking the film. You still got part of it. Get rid of it, Skip. Get rid of it. You're clean now. Sure, sure. You know, you sound just like you mean it. Every word. I'm sorry I spoiled your big score. $25,000. Skip, I, I know it sounds corny to you, but I'd rather have a live pickpocket than a dead traitor. And I'd rather have a girl who talked without a twist. I told you before, I wouldn't lie to you. Does Joey know where I live? Yes, but I didn't tell him. I didn't. Who did? Your address, I had it written down in my purse. It was on the table when Joy came for the film with me. Only now it's gone. Mr. Zara told me it's gone. Oh, just don't go back there. Please. Not till I find Joy. He, he did this to you, huh? Yeah. Tried to kill you? Yeah. Why? I wouldn't tell him where you lived. Thanks. Thanks, sir. I'll be back to see you tomorrow. <laughs> McCoy went to his shack early that night. He didn't stay there long, just long enough to light a lantern and haul up the beer case and remove the tiny piece of film, the frame he'd cut off. Then he climbed down below the shack, crawled out on the beams and pilings over the water, and waited. Almost three hours went by before they showed up. Joey and the man named Fenton. He's not here, then why is a lantern? It means he's coming back. Why didn't you get in touch with me earlier? I couldn't take a chance till the cops were off my butt. What makes you think they're off? You sure this is the right place? She wrote it down on a card. I found it in a purse. How much time have we got? Not much. 30 minutes. You better deliver what you've got. Mr. Big is getting angry. Well, maybe it's better if you turn it over. I'll stay here and wait for McCoy. I'll wait. Get going, Joey. Tell the boss I'll meet him at the airport with the other frame, but not to wait. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell him. <laughs> Joey headed for a subway station a block away. McCoy followed some distance behind him. In the subway station, McCoy bought a newspaper. He folded it at the classified ad section and waited for the train. He 
watched as Joey entered the car, then sat down at the other end. As they passed 33rd Street, Joey got up and waited in the vestibule. McCoy didn't move, and the train went on to Times Square. This was what Skip had been hoping for. People, crowds of people pushing their way into the subway. The after-theater crowd. He moved closer to Joey. He was next to him now, pretending to read a newspaper. His right hand moved toward Joey. In a moment, his fingers finally closed on what he wanted. Now the train was stopping. 72nd Street. Joey got off. So did McCoy. In the station washroom, a man was waiting for Joey. He took the envelope with the film and started out. But in the doorway, blocking his way, was McCoy. That film, Buster. There's a frame missing. What? You get out of my way! <laughs> it's me, Joey. McCoy. I've been looking for you. Yes, I know. It's going to be easier than I hope for. Is it? Your gun's gone, Joey. I got it. I figured I was all through picking pockets in the subway. Guess I'll never reform, huh? Oh, wait, wait. You wanted money, we can still do business. What's it worth to you? All I want is you, Joey. There's a dame named Moe's death. <laughs> and another name... Who's still in the hospital. <laughs> There's your gun, Joey. Now go on. Go get your gun. <laughs> I went back to Washington the following day, but before I left, I stopped by the hospital with Captain Tiger. Look, you keep telling me it's all over, but what happened? Ask him. Ask McCoy, the big hero. (laughs) Tiger's mad, baby. I busted up their act last night. I got Joey before they did. He also got the man we really wanted. You can stop worrying, miss. They're both in jail. Skip. It may interest you, miss. The the police, well, they're giving McCoy a clean bill of health. Well, here's the paper, honey. <laughs> Just about broke Tigers, huh? It wasn't my idea. It was the commissioner's. I had you right where I wanted you. A gun in your pocket. Next time, Zyron, the big wheels won't be around to run interference for you. Look, you've got no right to talk to him like that. I don't care what he was. Why don't you give him a chance? That's telling them, Muffin. Him? I give him 30 days before I pick him up again with his hand in somebody's pocket. You want a bet? Come on, Mr. Zara, let's get out of here. You never give up, do you, Captain? Why can't you give McCoy a break? That'd make him look soft in front of his girlfriend. We got a solid citizen in there, Mr. Zara. Let's keep him solid. In a moment, our stars will return. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Today, one of our outstanding ambassadors of goodwill is Nelson Rockefeller, grandson of John D. With his brothers, Nelson has invested $3 million in a business partnership with South American nationals. The official title of this venture is the International Basic Economy Corporation, what South Americans call it El Plan Rockefeller. With American equipment and techniques, among other things, Nelson Rockefeller has built a profit-showing fishery in Venezuela, a reconversion plant to turn powdered milk imported from the United States back into fluid milk, a food warehousing and distribution concern, a series of model and self-supporting farms, and a 300-acre hog farm. Throughout South America, the Rockefeller plan has set up thriving businesses, enthusiastically supported by the people and the governments of the two nations. Part of the plan's profits go back into other projects for food production and distribution, where little or no production has been done before. Part will help finance the American International Association, a non-profit organization set up to study scientific nutrition, sanitation, hygiene, and child welfare. In ten years, when the International Basic Economy Corporation is fully established, 
its stock will be sold to citizens of the countries in which it now operates. As Nelson Rockefeller put it, the people of South America don't want Santa Claus gifts. They want to be partners and with us do the job of helping themselves. Mr. Rockefeller knows only too well that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are, three very nice people, Steve McNally, Terry Moore, and Thelma Ritter. <laughs> Thelma, we can tell you how happy we are that you came all the way back from New York again to play the part of Mo. Well, I enjoyed every minute of it. Now, I don't want any of you to miss next week's play because, by popular demand, we have invited that scintillating comedian, glamorous Rosalind Russell, co-starring with that fine established actor, Robert Young, in a sparkling comedy from Warner Brothers Studio, It's Goodbye, My Fancy, the light-hearted story of a smart, sophisticated congresswoman who returns to her alma mater and tries to recapture an old romance. I'll be listening from New York. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Come again. Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Mr. Irving Cummings, our orchestra directed by Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to be with us again next week for another worldwide presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater, brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. (laughs) 